scripture this morning talks about hatred, talks about division at a time when the church is celebrating beginning tomorrow the entrance, the triumphal entry of our Lord and Savior into Jerusalem just prior to his crucifixion and victory. Amen. It is a sad reminder that we do live in times of difficulty. We do live in times that, uh, where there is terror. We also live in times where God's people are being tested, they're being killed. But this is to be a week of remembrance. This coming week and churches all across our nation and around the world will be celebrating what is called Passion Week where the Lord enters into Jerusalem for the last time in his earthly life where he will be welcomed with palm branches and cloaks being placed on the ground before him only to have those very same people in just a couple of days, call for his death. <clears throat> but death is not the victor. And that is not the end of the story. It is only beginning. Amen? Amen. This week, uh, while Margaret and I were out, I was pulled out of our building and uh, drove down. I was headed up Route 3. And I had to stop at an intersection between, I'm not sure what route it is, but anyway, route three is this way. And I had to stop because of the red light. And I looked up and there was a sign that said, no right turn on red. Well, I wasn't in that lane. I was going left, but this van pulled up in the right lane and waited for a couple of cars to go through and then made a right turn on red. I got to thinking about that in the light of what was read to us this morning about rebellion. And rebellion takes shape in many ways, in various ways. And I looked, I, I, it irritated me. Now I'm not going right. I'm going left. Has anybody ever felt that way? When you, when you are there and you are observing the law, the rules, and somebody decides to break the rules. Now, it doesn't affect me. It did not put me in harm's way. It did not, you know, shake my faith or, or have any earth-shattering thing. But it just irritated me that he would do that. Can't he read? <laughs> But then I get people that pass me on the right at an intersection only to go across the right, the intersection, so that they can be ahead of me. Now, I know none of you do that. I know that when you are out there, you obey the rules, which is what it's all about. Amen? We are to obey the rules. Jesus came into a time when the rules were not being followed. Oh, there were people who tried to follow man-made rules. Those rules that had been put in place by the Pharisees and by the scribes. But Jesus saw that they were circumventing the rules, his rules, God's rules. We get in a hurry. We have places to be. We have people who need to see us. And so we get irritated when something enters in or another car, whatever it might be, that would keep us from what we have purpose to do. And sometimes what we need to do is slow down. Sometimes we need to look around us and we need to remember <clears throat> why we're here and that the world 
This is not about us, but it is about God. Ultimately, isn't that what life is about? It is about our God. It's not about my creature comfort, not about your creature comfort, but it is about God's will and God's design and God's desire. We talked a little bit about that this morning in Sabbath school uh, because one of the people in the Sabbath school just, you know, why did it happen this way? Well, and the only thing, like Saul, I had a day off, I had things I needed to do. But then there were other things that came in that <clears throat> caused me to be diverted from what I was going to do. But he said, I believe that that was God. And I believe that the things that you and I experience, if we were only aware of them, it would be God working in our lives, just moving us, putting us in places that His desire needs us to be. So that's how I live my life. Let's go to chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 13, Mark. <clears throat> because I've always been one that has wondered how the world is going to end. Is there anybody here that has that same kind of wondering. Now it is not something that, that just totally engulfs me and I can't do anything else. Because I believe that God has everything in His hands. But I wonder how it's all going to end. Well, at the very beginning of this, the disciples leave with Jesus now out of the temple. And what they see when they come out of the temple are is the magnificence of the buildings. Gee, look at these stones. Look at these buildings. Aren't they wonderful? Because their focus, if you will, was on the physical was on the world that they see. How many of us, as we have traveled around, said to something, we see something in the distance or something as we go by in our car, and we go, isn't that beautiful? When we drive through Virginia, we see these, these beautiful farms, horse farms. And the horses, especially in the spring, when they're out in the, the pastures and they're running and they're jumping, you know, and you just... Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? As we travel around the world, we are inspired by a number of beautiful things that we see. So the disciples looking out, look at the buildings, the stones, and they say, aren't these wonderful? And the Lord comes back to them and says, you see all these stones, you see all these buildings? The time is coming when not one stone will be on another. They will be torn down. I think sometimes, like the disciples, you and I have a tendency to look at life from the here and now. You and I have a problem looking at life in the future because we cannot fathom a world like we see proclaimed in the Bible, heaven, where the streets of gold and walls of jasper and pearl, thrones and especially one with Jesus upon it. We have a tough time. We can see all the pictures that have been uh, done by artists trying to, you know, at least give to us a visual aspect of that. But I don't think that anything that we can come up with or think about or even imagine 
will be as great as what heaven is really like. Why? Because it is a spiritual kingdom and not a physical kingdom. And we can't understand that either. Well, one of the questions I had when I was a child was, how are they going to put all the people in one city? You know, you've got people around the world. And yet everybody's going to be there that is a follower of Christ. And then in my, my childlike mind, I said, well, there can't be very many people following Christ because there won't be room for them. Well, of course, later I learned that it's not going to be like the cities that we're used to. I think we're going to be surprised. I think that, that when the Lord comes back, and we go to heaven. I don't think that Gary Jenkins and uh, Tim LaHaye and their 14 volumes can even begin to put down in, on paper or begin to imagine what it is going to be like. Jesus tries to pull his disciples away from this, you know, well, aren't these stones beautiful? Aren't these buildings beautiful? To relay a point to them. See, they're one day going to be all gone. One day. That which we think is so good, so beautiful, and so forth, is going to be destroyed. Matter of fact, there isn't anything that you and I own that can't be destroyed. That can be here today and gone tomorrow. In New York City, there were two apartment buildings or two homes that literally blew up. And I'm sure that those people woke up that morning and didn't say, well, today my house is going to be gone. But in an instant, that which they had was destroyed. Even our cars. How many have had to replace washers and dryers? And, and boy, weren't they the top of the line. They were good. And see, I think sometimes that's how we view heaven. Or maybe we don't even think about it because we can't fathom what it's going to be like. But Jesus tries to pull them away from looking at the beauty of that which is around them and give to them something higher, something better, something more beautiful. Now, they didn't understand. So in the Garden of Olives, in the Mount of Olives, Peter, James, John, Andrew said, What do you mean? What is it that you're trying to say? He said, see to it that no one misleads you. Now he has said that before, and the apostles writing to the churches, Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, I would not have you to be unaware. Be not deceived. In Galatians, Paul writes to them, to the church there. He says, I'm so, I'm just distressed. I'm, I, I can't believe that you would be deceived and move away from the gospel that you received. Sometimes we can become so enamored with the things around us that we can lose our eternal perspective. That we begin to think that everything is going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Even though the world is in turmoil right now, we're okay. We live in security. I don't know of any one of us here who feels threatened. 
by what's going on in the world today. We may not like the fact that our taxes are going up and so forth, but we pay our taxes, and, which is, by the way, what we're supposed to do. And we make do and, you know, it kind of all works out. What Jesus wants us to do is to look beyond the physical. That there is a judgment that is coming. That even though he's getting ready, he's prepared now to go to Jerusalem for the last time in his earthly life, he will come again and he will come in judgment. And Paul writes to the church at Corinth, the day is coming when each one of us will stand before the judgment seat. It is appointed on every man once to die and then the judgment. And we will be judged for what we have done in the body, whether it be good or bad. So he says to them, don't let anybody mislead you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. Boy, we see that in our world today. There was a man by the name of Sun Myung Moon <clears throat> who stated that he had come to complete what Jesus had failed to complete. And that he was the Messiah. Millions of people followed him. Jim Jones, who took like 800 people to Guyana, convinced them that he was the Messiah. And when all of it began to fall apart, got all of those people to drink poison Kool-Aid. Men, women, children. Many messiahs will come in my name, he says. And they will say, I am he. I am the one. But don't believe them. They will mislead many. We are told in the revelation that even the very elect will be deceived. Then there are those people who, who try to put into perspective all of the wars and the rumors of wars that are going on in our world today. And he says these things must take place, but it is not yet the end. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. But this is merely the beginning. Now isn't that a strange prediction? And then he goes on to say this. And you know what? There's coming a time when they're going to come against you. And they're going to put you in prison. There's a time coming when they will arrest you in verse 11, hand you over, and at that time, don't worry about what you're going to say, but say whatsoever is given to you in that hour. So here is Jesus lifting their perspective, if you will, from that which is physical, from that which is the here and now, to look beyond that into the eternal. Because he says, what's going to happen here, and he said this in the Gospels, in other places, he said, you will be hated because of me. Well, I'd rather look at the beautiful buildings. I would rather have my thoughts consumed 
with all of the beauty around us. Well, and what Jesus would say, I believe, is enjoy the beauty that is around us. Enjoy it. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon and seen, seen that magnificent canyon, if you have been to the top of the Washington Monument and looked out and seen this beautiful area that you and I live in, yes, enjoy that. But understand that that's not our life. That our life is in Christ. And that what happens to Christ in this pivotal week of His life here on earth <clears throat> has eternal consequences for you and me. And so for a while He takes them and He gives them some pretty powerful predictions. First of all, the stones are going to be destroyed. Secondly, that you're going to be arrested. Wow. That's something I want to think about. And yet at the same time, I live every day of my life understanding and realizing that there is coming a time when this body is going to fail. And I am going to be ushered into whatever is it, the life beyond. And I don't know what it is. I just know it's real. Even though I can't see it. You understand that? And so God has given us some wonderful things. Some marvelous things to look at. You know, that are pleasing to the eye. How many of you take pictures and keep them? Okay. Everybody here that has a camera. Matter of fact, since I've been here and we've been taking pictures here at Central, I have them on an external hard drive. I'm saving them. And many people look at our Facebook page and see pictures. And Ruth is taking pictures today. And they're going to see the pictures that she has taken on our Facebook page. So people all over the world are going to be able to see us. We all do that. And we enjoy them and we savor them. But one day they're going to be gone. Amen? Amen. You understand that. And so I'm not saying don't enjoy. Don't take pictures. Don't savor those memories. I'm not saying that at all. As a matter of fact, because we have that eternal perspective, we, at least for me, I savor them more. In the light of what eternity is, I enjoy the here and now from a whole different perspective. The older I get, the more time I want to spend with my family. The whole time that I'm, that I'm here, even, even now, I want to spend with things that are, that are of value, that have an eternal perspective. Margaret and I have traveled to Brazil. And inevitably, somebody asks as they're doing our schedule, what would you like to do? Where would you like to go? What would you like to see? And my response is always this. I want to be in churches. I want to visit with pastors. I want to be doing God's work. And we've seen some beautiful places as we've traveled from one place to another. And God's world is amazing. It is beautiful and it is intricate. I go in to a room where there is a new baby. And I get to hold this baby and there was a, a child that is a part of this congregation that when I went to Helder, I held her 
like this. Angie, two pounds? Four pounds? Not very big. But I held her. <coughs> well, now I can't do that. She jumps in my arms and I go, oh, man. But God's world is marvelous, intricate. And yet, he says, this world is not all there is. But there is a world beyond. And you better be right. Or you're going to be left. That kind of takes away from the idea that everybody's going to make it. I've heard people say that. I believe, this was on television. I believe, this man said, that on the judgment day that God's going to look out over all of humanity. And he's going to say, oh, come on in. The Bible says differently, doesn't it? Man. The Bible says that those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life aren't going to make it. They're going to be cast out in utter darkness. Now, I don't know what that means. I just know that it means that you're without God, without Christ. You are completely separated. I don't like the idea of wailing and gnashing of teeth that we find. So we don't like to think about those things. We like to think about the beauty that is around us. Knowing Jesus Christ makes the beautiful things more beautiful. Because I look beyond just the fact that they're beautiful to how they were made. What caused people to design? Just think about it. People who design buildings. And all the pieces fit. And there have to be, you know, the structure has to be such that it will withstand wind and rain and, and, and all of that. And, and so that a four-story building. I think about that every time I go into our apartment building. I'm on the fourth floor. And I'm thinking, you know what? There are people that live right below us. Now, we don't have any wild parties or anything like that. But you know what I think about? I think about all of the work that had to go in to make sure that my apartment didn't end up on the third floor. Do you ever stop to think about that? I do. And so I look at our building and I'm awed by the fact that somebody had the brain to figure all that out because it just boggles my mind. God wants us to enjoy the beauty. It is His that He has given to us. But understand this, that that beauty is one day going to be destroyed. That one day, heaven and earth will pass away. But He said, my word will never pass away. Then he gives the disciples this panorama, if you will, this whole idea of you will hear war about wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise up against nation. Boy, don't we see that in our world today. And yet Jesus said, don't be alarmed. It's only the beginning. It's a warning. And every time I turn the TV on and I watch the news and so forth, I am reminded that this world is going to end. Some people think it's going to end sooner than later. There's an awful lot of rhetoric out there about the political system and, you know, the religious system and so forth. The Bible says don't be alarmed but don't be led astray. Set your mind on those things that are above, not on those things that are below. <clears throat> and 
In 1811, 1811, 1812, there was a series of great earthquakes in Arkansas. It rearranged the architect of the landscape of that area, it caused rivers to change courses, filled the skies with dirt and ash, sparked many fires. On May the 18th, 1988, Volcano named Mount St. Helens in Montana erupted. The eruption was triggered by a violent earthquake that caused a rock slide comprised of one half cubic mile of rock. As the summit and north slope of that volcano slid down her sides, pressure was released inside the volcano where super hot liquid water immediately flashed to steam. The northward directed steam explosion released energy equivalent, are you ready? To 20 million tons of TNT, which toppled 150 square miles of forest in six minutes. In Spirit Lake, north of the volcano, an enormous water wave initiated by one eighth cubic mile of rock slide debris stripped trees from slopes as high as 850 feet above the pre-eruption water level. The total energy output on May 18th was equivalent to 400 million tons of TNT, approximately 20,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. The explosion Showered towns as far as 250 miles away with volcanic ash. Every 3.6 seconds, someone dies of starvation. Every year, 15 million children die of starvation of hunger-related illnesses. Four million people starve to death every year. 1.3 million people live on less than a dollar of income per day. And another 3 billion have survived, <clears throat> have to survive on less than $3 a day. Famines devastate the poor of the world. And someone has said we are just one bad harvest away from starvation here in America. I'm not saying don't be concerned. I'm not saying hide your eyes from that. But our eternal perspective then demands that we live our lives in, in such a way to help others. I'm compelled by the love of God to help those who are in need, to give. Amen? But I'm not so devastated that it completely debilitates me from doing. You understand? There are those people that look at the world today and they are so devastated by what's going on and their ability to do anything about it that they would just rather pull the covers over their head, go back, go back to bed and pull the covers over their head. Or just to deny that it exists and go on about their own merry way. And yet our life on earth is much more complicated than that. If you have seen me naked and not clothed me, if you have seen me hungry and not fed me, Jesus said if you have done that, whether you have fed or not fed, if you've done that to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. But our eternal perspective must be solid. And he will lead and guide and direct us to do those things to be where he wants us to be.
Does it make sense? I'm not saying just hide your head, don't be concerned about it. But first and foremost, we need to understand that the day is coming when Jesus is going to come back. When he rose and ascended into heaven, the angel said to those that were there, why are you looking up the same one, the same way he went, it's going to come back again. And it is appointed on every man once to die, and then the judgment. Amen. And you see, no matter how much good we do, no matter how much of our resources we spend, without Jesus Christ it is for nothing. Without Jesus Christ, if we're not right, we're going to be left. And that's according to God's Word. That's the point of what Jesus was saying to His disciples. The Lord wants us to live our lives... <clears throat> in such a way he wants us to live <coughs> as though he were coming today at any second we're not to get caught up in guessing when he's going to come We're not to be looking for signs because the signs have already been given. As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the bowels of the earth. The sign has been given. Jesus is alive. Jesus was seen going into heaven and it was proclaimed to them that He was coming back. And the message must be, be right or be left. Jesus is coming. But when He does, it won't be announced. When Jesus comes, He will come like a thief in the night the trumpet will sound. The skies will open. And Jesus will come again. So enjoy the beauty that is around us. Enjoy the beauty that God has created for us. Enjoy the beauty of each other that God has put into us. Enjoy the food that we're to have in just a little bit. Enjoy all of that. But understand this, that there is judgment coming. And if we are in Christ, we have passed from darkness into light. Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number 201. And while we're singing, if uh, you feel the need to have prayer, I want you to come. I'll be glad to, to meet with you and pray with you. But I just want to give you this. I am so, so concerned about this world. I am not concerned about my life. I'm concerned about my children's life. I'm not concerned about Margaret's life. Margaret and I, we are, we're in the hands of God. Our children have more years left on this earth. Many of you have more years left on this earth than I do. That's where my concern is. That you be not deceived. That you be not led astray. 
that you're right and not left. Amen? Amen. Hymn or 201, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin.